Right. What are we doing now? That's possible. I have no idea. We try to do that World War One. That's not possible. Alright. Oh. Germany. By the time the war breaks out in 1939, Germany has already, without firing a shot, uh, allied itself with Austria, conquered Czechoslovakia, this little town up here called Neville. Uh, Hitler and Stalin make their little deal um, in August of 1939, and in the next week, the war breaks out. Germany invades Poland uh, from three sides. Poland is conquered in the span of about two weeks, and to add insult uh, to injury, um, the Soviets go to war. Also, the Soviets gobble up this third of Poland, and then the Soviets conquer Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia just for kicks. Great Britain and France are at war. They just kind of sit there and don't do anything. Um, they are kind of depending on their defensive lines here in eastern France uh, to stop any German invasion. Uh, they are afraid of going on the offensive because, of course, they remember what happened in World War I. All the flowers. All the flowers. In April of 1940, Germany conquers Denmark in a day and Norway in about two weeks. In April of 1940. On May 9th, 1940, uh, comes the long-awaited invasion of the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. And unlike in World War I, where the French army managed to stop the Germans outside of Paris, in World War II, the French army is destroyed, France is defeated, and France surrenders in six weeks. Italy gets involved in it, kind of stabbing France in the back. Wow. France falls to the Germans. Switzerland, nobody touches Switzerland. Spain stays out. They're kind of on Hitler's side morally, but they're not going to get involved. Sweden? Neutral. So no one touches Switzerland with Sweden? Nope. The British, and we're going to do this next week, the British manage to extricate their army from the convent. It's called the Miracle of Dunkirk. Really cool story. We'll tell it next week. Um, but now Great Britain is completely alone. Figuring if you can't beat them, join them, the small remaining countries, or many of the small remaining countries of Eastern Europe, join the German side. Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. Albania is conquered by the Italians. Hitler expects Great Britain to deal, to parley, to negotiate. Um, on the day that Germany invaded France, Chamberlain is uh, removed from office by the House of Commons. Somebody kind of stood up and said, you know, you have been here for too long for any good that you are doing. In the name of God, go, man. Um, and Chamberlain was replaced by Churchill. Um, we'll do Churchill next week. What year was this? 1940, May the 9th. Um, Hitler has a plan to invade the British Isles. And if you remember what we talked about earlier in the week, remember Hitler's goal is to take care of Western Europe, to open up his flank, to one day attack the Soviet Union, and establish this gigantic German colony here in what is Poland and the Ukraine and Russia, uh, and pretty much just starve to death all the people that are living there. But he thinks that he has to kind of break Britain first. So he comes up with, the, and Britain pretty much at this point has no arm. Um, they had, their guys were saved from the continent, but in order to get back to England, they had to leave their trucks, their guns, their tanks, their planes, everything. Uh, the guys survived, but you know, here's Germany's got 125 divisions on the continent. Great Britain has two. Uh, 
fully equipped mobile divisions in England at the time. The problem, as it always is for anybody wanting to invade England, is you've got to cross that water. Um, and what, start, what happens now is called the Battle of Britain. In order, so technology has changed. And this is going to play a role in the war in the Pacific also. Ships no longer kind of rule the water. Now a gigantic $200 million battleship can be sunk by a $20,000 airplane. So in order to invade England, Germany has to clear the water so their invasion ships can get across. And in order to clear the water, they have to prevent the British Navy from coming down and interfering with the invasion. And in order to make the British Navy unable to operate in the channel, they have to make sure that German airplanes, and only German airplanes, can fly over the channel. So what you get is about a five-week air battle over southern England, where German fighters come over and try to destroy the, the Royal Air Force, destroy their bases, destroy their runways, destroy their planes. And every day, the people in England could look up in southern England could look up in the sky and see these fighter battles going on, you know, over their head. And they could watch planes get shot down, and they would land in their farms, and their fields, and their cities. Um, it was a close-run thing. And Churchill gave one of his famous little pithy quotes. He said, "Never in the field of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few." Uh, implying the pilots uh, of the Royal Air Force. Germany cannot destroy fighter command, and Great Britain retains air control over southern England and over the Channel. Hitler retaliates by terror bombing London. Um, at night, um, raids of bombers come over the city of London and other British cities and indiscriminately drop bombs uh, in an attempt to make Britain surrender. That the idea goes that the people will be so scared and terrified that they will demand that their government uh, surrender to the Germans. Uh, for weeks on end, through Christmas of 1940, this air bombardment of London goes on pretty much every night. Um, and the population of London, when you hear the air raid sirens, you go underground and live in the subways and hope you don't take a direct hit. Uh, Buckingham Palace was hit. Parliament was destroyed by a bomb. Um, now they was in there. Nighttime. But that's what's going on here. But the English, the English don't break. They don't crack. Um, under Churchill's leadership, they vow to fight on. Um, in the spring of so 1941, Hitler is unable to launch his attack on Great Britain. It's his first loss. Um, he then says, "Well, you know what? Fine. Great Britain was not conquered, but they are." They're small, they're weak, they have no way to attack, you know, Germany on the continent. Hitler's going to turn east anyway. His ally Mussolini in Italy gets him into a little bit of a mess. Mussolini tried to conquer Greece, um, but the Greeks kind of kicked the Italians out, so the Germans had to come in, and the Germans conquered Yugoslavia and Greece and the Greek island of Crete. And then the Germans kind of crossed over to North Africa and began an invasion of British Egypt. Egypt as a British colony. Then... Now, when France, just to kind of finalize the map, when France surrendered, a pro-German French government um, is kind of forced into power, which turns the French colonies in North Africa into pro-German. So this is the map um, at the invasion of Russia on June the 20th, 1941. Great Britain is fighting, but it is fighting alone. This is kind of in the mid this is uh, right around when Lend Lease starts to happen. The United States starts supplying Great Britain with um, large numbers of materials, all aid short of war, um, is kind of what Roosevelt says. Hitler feels himself at this point ready to launch the attack that is kind of the purpose of the whole war, his attack on the Soviet Union. He is going to line up the largest invasion ever in history up to that point in time. It will only be 
The only invasion in history that is going to be larger than this one will be the Soviet counter-invasion of Germany four years later. Uh, all along this enormous front, for about 800 miles, Hitler lines up 3 million men, 10,000 tanks, 20,000 aircraft, 50,000 people. Can we please have Denny Rodriguez and, and Lindsay Montes please come down to the main offices? <clears throat> Hitler. Hitler launches his war on the Soviet Union. He expects the war to be over. He defeated France in six weeks. He expects to defeat the Russians just as fast. And he's got a couple things kind of going for him. First, Stalin spent the entire decade of the 1930s destroying his own officer corps. He executed his top three marshals of the 20 top generals. He executed 18 of them. Picked you know, the, the 300 colonels. He executed 275 of them. Uh, so the entire Red Army in the 1930s was completely decapitated. Yeah. What was Mussolini's point on the pillar? What do you mean? What was his point? Did he care that he was invading the Soviet Union? Hitler? Yeah. He really didn't care one way or another. Hit, Mussolini's goal is to kind of create this new Roman Empire in you know the Balkans and Africa. Um, it was an utter failure, but by that point he was kind of stuck to Hitler, and Hitler started saying, all right, I need Italian troops for this, and the Italian troops for that, and the Italians kind of ended up okay. Um, by about 1941, they're sort of unwilling partners in this. Um, but they're stuck. Hitler, so anyway, so Stalin decapitates his army. The Russian army, the Soviet army, actually did fight a war, in two wars in 1939. First they invaded Poland, but they didn't face any resistance because the Poles were all facing the Germans. And then they went and invaded Finland uh, and got their asses kicked by the Finns, um, which is hard to do. Um, the Finnish soldiers, they're kind of fighting on skis. Like in the mountains, and you know, and, and uh, the Russian soldiers, you know, where they they were, they outnumbered the Finns. But finally, the Finns did lose, but only after the Russians just threw in, you know, it's in, until the odds were like ten to one. They were the Russians. The Finns out. So anyway, Hitler feels Hitler feels very confident. He said that the Soviet Union is like a rotten house. You kick in the door, and the whole thing will just come crumbling down. And that's what Hitler did when he invaded the Soviet Union in June of 1941. He's got two goals. Leningrad and Moscow. So like these are the first two cities of the Soviet Union. You take these cities. He's not in, he is perfectly fine for the Soviet Union to exist west, excuse me, east of the Ural Mountains. He wants European Russia, the Ukraine, all of this area, like we said, to establish these German colonies and to starve everybody else to So he launches this invasion, this largest invasion the world has ever seen up to that point. And the invasion goes incredibly well. Stalin was warned by Churchill that the Germans were coming. They were coming this week. Stalin did not believe him, thought it was a capitalist plot to make the Soviet Union attack Germany. So the, the Russians are completely unprepared. And the Russians start taking unimaginably huge casualties. We're talking two million dead in the first two weeks of the war. Around Kiev, a Soviet army surrendered. 700,000 people surrendered at one time. That the numbers are staggering. And what made it worse, and I want to talk about this briefly, War. 
traditionally has rules. There are laws of war that countries tend to follow. The rules in the West were generally followed. Allied soldiers that are captured by Germans, British and American soldiers captured by the Germans generally get treated according to the rules. The rules are generally followed here, not here. Hitler orders his troops to fight a war of extermination, and Stalin reciprocates. Soviet prisoners taken by the Germans, get sent back to Germany as slave laborers. Most of them did not come out of the war alive. Commanders were ordered, in many cases, not to take prisoners, um, just to shoot them on both sides. It is a bloodbath. It's a bloodbath. That of all, of all the German soldiers that died in World War II, over 80% were killed by the Soviets. This is where the war is. This is important. This is where Hitler's going to win or lose. He's going to win or lose against the Soviets. And the invasion is taking a little, it's starting to take a little longer than Hitler envisioned. Russia is big. One of the other problems is Hitler calculates that Stalin has about 300 divisions. That's about 3 million men. In reality, Stalin has about 600 divisions, which is about 6 million men. And as many losses as the Soviets take, there are always reinforcements coming up. And Stalin gives his political commissars clear orders. Anybody who surrenders, you show, or their retreats, you shoot them. So the Russian soldiers kind of stood and died and constantly fell back. But they were still fighting. Stalin keeps feeding men into this conflict. The German advance starts to slow down. And then it's around October, and it starts to get cold. Not like this wussy cold. Real cold. Like Russian cold. We're talking like minus 30, minus 40. Holy, like cold. Just to kind of give you a sense of what minus, just to give you a sense of what minus 40 is, imagine, here's 20 degrees like today. It's cold. You're all coming in here complaining how cold it is. It's five The difference. The difference between negative 40 and 20 is the same as the difference between 20 degrees and 80. It's cold. It's like five minutes with exposed skin, you have frostbite cold. When you pee, guys, your pee freezes before it hits the ground. Yeah, it's cold. Hopefully it's not very long pee. Where it's five minutes of getting in the Yeah, you snap it off. Oh my god! One of the problems. The Germans expected this campaign to go quickly. They don't have winter clothes. Their invasion kicks off with only their summer gear. By October, now they kind of, there's this massive effort in Germany to send the troops with blankets and sweaters and coats and hats and scarves and stuff. But thousands of German soldiers die of exposure in the cold. Um, the other problem that starts to happen, there's a couple, so engines can't start. Engines can't start when it's minus 40 degrees. So to keep a tank or an airplane running, you have to continually run the engine. Which does what to your fuel? Weight, Weight burns your fuel incredibly quickly. Now, as the lines get longer, as the germ as the front moves further away from Germany, every gallon of fuel has to be shipped on a railroad car from Germany to the Cape's. You st the German army starts to have significant fuel shortages because they have to run their engines constantly, and it takes a long time to get the fuel out there. In, by November, 
However, the German advance has succeeded in surrounding Leningrad, and they besiege the city. Leningrad is going to be under siege for 987 days. Of the population of 3 million civilians in Leningrad, well over half died uh, in that siege. The Leningraders are reduced to cannibalism, um, commonly um, not, not pleasant. By October, the German army can see Moscow in the distance. They can see the, they're in the suburbs. They can see the center of town on a clear day. But that is as far as they're going to get. Stalin gathers up a bunch of reinforcements. They are ready for the winter. They are troops from Siberia. They got furry boots and furry hats and furry coats. And they counterattack. Hitler orders, Hitler orders his troops not to give an inch of ground. And it is testament to the toughness, put your phone away, of German soldiers that they fight off these counterattacks while Stalin is freezing to death in the snow outside of Moscow and Leningrad. That is where the war kind of grinds to a halt by December 7th, 1941, when the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor and the United States enters the war. The United States enters the war with the map kind of looking like this. Wow. Is that as big as the US? That's about the, so from 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 the Spanish border to Moscow is probably about 3,000 miles, probably about the size of you from New York to LA. Um, wow. That was like the entire United States. However, <laughs> Churchill in his diary writes that on the night of December 7th, he went to bed. He slept like a baby, knowing that no matter what was going to happen in the interim, eventually the weight of the United States' manpower and industrial power would lead eventually to victory. He said he slept the sleep of a saved man um, on December the 7th, 1940. Wait, Mr. Hughes, wait. Hold on. Yeah, that, like, if you want to consider, you know, I think I might have mentioned this. The way to understand, uh, in very simple, three little phrases, how did the Allies win World War II? Great Britain bought the time, the Soviets bought the manpower, and the Americans bought the stuff. Um, and if you want to remember kind of how this was done, I'm sure you should be able to write a couple sentences on each of those. Why did the Allies win World War II? Well, the British bought the time, the Russians bought the manpower, the Americans bought the stuff. Um, and that can kind of make, make clear, kind of in very broad terms, how Hitler and the Japanese were. Hitler was the key. This is as pretty much as big, almost, as Hitler's empire is going to get. Starting in the spring of 19... All right, so we're going to do some turning points. Okay. Hitler tries again when the spring comes in 1942 to knock the Soviets out of the war. And this time he is going to attack the... Soviet city of Stalingrad. If he breaks Stalingrad, what that does is it severs Moscow kind of from where his food and iron and coal supplies were. So his goal is this city of Stalingrad on the banks of the Volga River. This is going to be the largest battle in history, like literally in history. Like, wow. Like, like literally. literally. Like the largest, in terms of total men engaged um, over the city of Stalingrad, well over 3 million men. Uh, participate in the Battle of Stalingrad, and it is the city's destroyed. Like if you look at pictures of Stalingrad, um, I can pop one up on the board for you. There's nothing left of Stalingrad. That people, that the Soviet troops and the German troops. Come on, there it is. Come on, internet. Come on, internet. All right, internet's not working. Come on, internet sucks. I can't wait to take this part. The whole campaign just crashing down. Um, 
Yeah. We're not all at the same time. I know, but they. Battle of Stalingrad destroys the entire city of Stalingrad. The it's a very close run thing. Um, eventually, there's a Soviet counterattack which surrounds an entire German army uh, in Stalingrad. Um, Hitler orders them to fight to the last man. And I'll just throw a number at you. Um, many, many died. Many, many thousands were taken prisoner. Of the 1.2 million Germans that invaded, that started this attack on Stalingrad, about 5,000 ever saw Germany again. Um, so you're talking about, you know, so the ones that died in the fighting, and then the ones that, you know, if you're taken prisoner, you are sent to a slave labor camp in Siberia where they work you till you die. Um, so of the, of, the, of the over 1 million, about 5,000 ever got hold um, again. They won Stalingrad, though. They won. They lost at Stalingrad. The Russians, the, the Soviets won that battle. That is the turning point of the war. The Russian victory, the Soviet victory at Stalingrad marks kind of the furthest advance of Hitler's forces. We're going to talk about three turning points. Um, one American in the Pacific. A British one here, but this is the big kahuna. After this, the story of World War II is going to be the slow and steady Soviet march back to Berlin, which is here. Long way to go. That's like back to the side. Yep. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the British are doing two things here. First, they defeat the Germans outside of Cairo at a place called El Alamein. The Battle of El Alamein is the turning point um, in North Africa. Churchill gets on the radio and says, is this the beginning of the end? No, but it at least is the end of the beginning. Um, in 1942, we see our, the first appearance of American troops in the European theater. This whole thing is the European theater of war. Uh, the Pacific theater will obviously be the war against Japan, which we will be talking about in about 20 or 15 minutes. The first troops, actually, that Americans fight in the European theater are French. We invade French North Africa. The French very quickly kind of give up, but then we are fighting Germans, and that's a lot harder. Why would the French fight against them? Uh, they were ordered to. Oh, okay. Um, remember, France now has this pro-German government. Uh, the, the French have managed to kind of hold on to sort of their colonies as long as they do what Germany wants them to do. One of the just one of the kind of really difficult parts of the war for Churchill was right after France surrendered. France has this powerful navy, um, and Churchill is obviously worried that that navy is going to fall uh, into German hands. Uh, so the week after the armistice, um, Churchill gets in touch with the French government and says, you got a choice. Um, sink your navy, sail your navy to England, or we're going to attack you. Um, and the French would not sink their navy, and they would not send it to England or the United States. Uh, so all across France and in Africa, the British Navy sank the French Navy. Um, killed thousands of French sailors, um, you know, the former allies. It was Churchill's one of the most difficult decisions that he had to make, but you know, in that situation, you know, difficult decisions were made you know, six times before, before breakfast every day. You can see kind of what the first thing that the Western Allies, the British and the French, are trying to do is kick the Germans out of North Africa. By 1943, that's what happens. Um, the British and Americans chase the Germans out of North Africa. Then the question starts to come. All the meanwhile, slowly, 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 against determined opposition the whole way, the Soviet advance is moving back towards Germany. 
In the summer of 1943, the Allies, the Western Allies, the British and the French have a decision to make. Stalin is jumping up and down. He wants them to attack France from England. He wants his cross-channel invasion of Europe, take on the Germans in France immediately, take some of this awful, awful pressure off of him, off of his troops fighting in the East. In May of 1943, Hitler launches another attack on the Eastern Front, ends up with the largest tank battle in history, about 6,000 tanks at one time just going at each other at a place called Kharkov um, in the Soviet Union. Churchill does not think that the Allies are ready for a cross-channel invasion of France. Um, he is worried of a repeat of World War I. He is worried that his people won't accept it. Hitler and Stalin got it easy. They're totalitarian dictators. They order three million men to die, and three million men are going to have to do it. Churchill and Roosevelt obviously don't have that luxury. They have to deal with a democratic legislature that is watching them the whole time. You know, Churchill is, you know, a couple bad military moves away from losing a vote of confidence and being replaced. Um, that's democracy. That's how it's supposed to work. So Churchill says, we can't invade France this year. What we can do, Churchill says, is knock Hitler's buddy Mussolini out of the war. So in 1943, from North Africa, you get an invasion of Sicily and an, an allied invasion of Italy. The Italians are thrilled to surrender um, to the allies, which they do. But then Germany invades Italy and kind of stops the allied advance south of Rome. Um, and lots and lots of Allied troops, you know, lose their lives fighting the Germans here in Central Italy. The other main thing that the Allies have been doing is a campaign of aerial bombardment on German cities. At both day and night, you fly these bombers over German cities with the express idea of hitting German factories and oil depots and places like that. Now, at the time and since, people have said, doesn't that make you just as bad as the Germans? That when you attack a factory, you're not killing soldiers. You're killing thousands of civilians. And yes, they were. And it's defended. I'm going to wake up Leslie. It's defended um, at the time and since by this concept. You know, what we see in World War II, and we have not seen it since. I'm going to put it up on the board is this concept of total war. That the entire society dedicates itself to the war effort. That from 1942 to 1945, you couldn't buy a new car in America. If you go there, there's no such thing as a 1943 Ford. It doesn't exist. What was Ford making? Tanks and Jeeps. You couldn't buy new clothes from 1942 to 1944. You couldn't buy new tires for your car. You couldn't buy, like, you couldn't, like, everything that the country did was directed at the war effort. Hollywood is enlisted to make movies explaining why we're fighting. That's what Ronald Reagan does during World War II. Ronald, he's an actor, he's a very, not, not a top of the list famous actor, but a well-known actor. And Ronald Reagan goes into the army, and the army says, make movies for us. That's what President Ronald Reagan did during the war. Um, one of the things I'm going to show you guys next week is a really cool propaganda cartoon that Walt Disney did with Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and uh, about Hitler and the war. The entire, that, Boy Scout troops went house to house collecting old pots and old pants for scrap metal. You know, Girl Scouts went around collecting cooking fat 
You know, you take old cooking fat, you turn that into grease. You know, guns need grease. Your trucks need the and schools would raise the schools would have comp my grandmother remembers this. Schools would have competitions to raise money to build a fire plane. That upper account, we're gonna raise this year ten thousand dollars. And we're gonna send that ten thousand dollars to the government, we'll be a fire plane named after us. And Aww. schools would compete to do this. Yeah. Like if it was for like if it was for a good cause but, but my point that the, 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 the people worked overtime for without getting extra money. That you were, if you worked, you, know, you didn't take vacations. You know, you worked on Saturday. Like the entire country. And it's not like World War I where a lot of people have to be coerced into this. Most everybody for this one's on board. There's no sedition act during World War II. There's wage controls to keep inflation down. There, and there's going to be inflation because people have no money to spend. They have the play. They have a lot of money to spend, but they have nothing to buy. <laughs> there's rationing. The government every month sends to your house ration cards, and if you want to buy meat, eggs, milk, you have to present your money in a ration card. And once your ration card is out, you can't buy that food item anymore. Gasoline was rationed. Rubber was rationed. Mm -hmm. Food stuffs, meat was rationed. All of this. The point is, that, and, and that's in the United States where there was no actual fighting. In Russia, in Germany, in England, it was much, much worse. But the point is that the entire country got involved in doing this. So how this kind of segues into this concept of aerial bombing here is... The, the logical thought goes, we want to win the war, obviously. You win the war by defeating the other side's army. If the other side has fewer tanks, it's going to make our, if us, our job easier. To prevent the other side from having lots of tanks, you have to destroy the tank factory. And if there happens to be civilians working in that tank factory, sorry. Oh, well. And that is the moral reasoning behind it. That if you don't ever bomb the tank factory, the oil refinery, etc., then the Germans are going to have more tanks to kill more Allied soldiers. And Churchill was aware of the moral dilemma that he was getting himself in. And he once kind of, because as nasty as the German bombing of London was, the Allies revisit that on Germany times 10 and more. That the Allied bombers by 1944 are bigger, they carry more bombs, they can fly higher, farther, faster, and there's a lot more of them. That it was a lot for Hitler to send 200 medium-sized bombers over London. By 1944, the Allies are launching 1,000 bomber raids of large, heavy bombers over German cities. The American Air Force bombs by night, and the British Air Force, the Royal Air Force, bombs during the day. Why? Uh, that was just they decided. Um, the American Air, the Americans had um, the Norden bomb site, which is this piece of technology that we wouldn't share that made it a little easier to bomb at night. Um, wow. There's pros and cons to both. You know, bombing during the day, um, you're kind of putting yourself out there for a lot heavier German um, aircraft to come try to shoot you down. Bomb at night, it's a lot easier to get lost and not be able to find your way home. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it's funny, but I want, like, here's kind of one of the problems. There's a problem in how we look at this. And I'm being serious now. Because we, pay, we play way too much Modern Warfare and Call of Duty. I want you to imagine, just, just in, for, for a second, for a second, try to put yourselves on a B-17, on a bomber. It's not pressurized, so you're in this kind of constrictive flight suit. You've got like the oxygen thing on when you're at height. It's cold, it's propeller driven, it's shaky. Eight hours, you know, from your base over Germany and back. When the bombardier line, my grandfather was a bombardier, when you line up your target, the plane is not allowed to maneuver. When you line up for that final approach to drop your bomb, for about 60 seconds, you are just flying in a big straight line, which makes you a big fat target 
for anti-aircraft guns from the ground, which shoot a shell that explodes, and the aircraft's skin is thin, you know, aircraft land back in England with holes in them all the time. Then there's enemy fighters at 400 miles an hour, you know, fly past your airplane trying to shoot it down. It's real guys, and it's real bullets that they're firing. And if they really hit you, it's 20,000 feet to the ground. Where if you manage to get your parachute on and survive, you might be taken prisoner or land in the 40 degree ocean and die of explosion. This is the, the loss rate for bombers over Germany in 1942-34 was about 3 or 4%. That means 3 or 4% every time a flight went up, 3 or 4% of it, one coming home. If I said every time you change classes, 3% of you are not going to make it back, you're going to get to the end of the day and your class of 25 is going to be down to about 15. Your job is done, you get to go home if when you complete 25 missions. The chance of completing 25 without is not super duper high. This is, and that's for the thousands and thousands of British and Americans who went up in these bombs. You know, the guys on the cargo ships. You know, sailing in the, the frigid North Atlantic, never knowing from moment to moment whether all of a sudden you're just going to explode from a torpedo that you never saw. We have to remove ourselves from the Call of Duty modern warfare sense of this. You only get one life. You know, there's no turning it off. You know, and the, the, the right, there's no restart. Game over. Yeah. So. Your, your, your bomb, so just a couple years ago, they found in the middle of the desert a British, a, a British bomber in the middle of nowhere in the desert. And what they realized had happened, and around the bomber were the mummified remains of the air crew. You know, some of them a little, some of them a couple miles away. They obviously tried to walk for, but the mummified in, in the desert, your body, you know, doesn't decompose all the way. But what happened, you know, sitting here about getting that the airplane was damaged, the, you know, the controls were hit, and the pilot thought he was heading for the water, and instead his plane was going the opposite way, and he just flew into the desert until he ran out of gas, and he landed the plane, and they died of thirst and starvation. Like, these are some brave guys, you know, on all sides. Whether you're fighting for something decent or fighting for something evil, you can't, you can't discount the bravery. So all of this bombing, what it's doing is har harming the Germans' ability to wage war. But it's not breaking them. The Germans didn't break just in the same way the British didn't break. In 1944, in June of 1944, Churchill still isn't hugely comfortable with it, um, comes the Allied invasion of France. It's the largest seaborne invasion in history, launching from southern England into northern France. This is what we know as D-Day. Uh, it's the Allied and British invasion oh, of France. Omaha Beach, Utah Beach, Sword, Juno, and Gold. Um, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a whole story of because the Germans didn't know. There's a lot of options where to land. Um, so where the landing was at? The landings uh, under the uh, command of an American, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Um, where the landing takes place is a huge secret, and there was a huge campaign done to make the Germans think that the, Al the landing was going to be here so they would put all their troops there when in reality it was at Normandy. Um, Churchill wants to land on the beaches with the men. Um, and no one, and he's like, I'm doing it. And they're like, you, you can't. Uh, and nobody could convince him. So the king kind of went to Churchill and said, all right, if you do it, I'm going to be standing right next to you. Churchill said, fine, I'll stay 
The church wasn't going to risk the, the king's life uh, in the same way that he was very perfectly willing to risk his own. Um, Churchill enjoyed the evening. Churchill got a, a kick, an adrenaline rush from being under fire. Um, and he was under fire quite a lot in his life. Um, he once said, the greatest feeling in the world is to be shot at to no effect. Um, the worst is to be shot at. Right, and to effect, right. So anyway, the Allies kind of get bogged down a little bit um, in northern France, but finally, um, George S. Patton, an American tank commander, breaks out. Paris is liberated uh, in the fall of 1944. All the while, and by the spring of 1944, 1945, Germany has been crushed like a mice. Every German city of any size has been reduced to rubble by bombing. The German economy has stopped. Hitler defending, Hitler has convinced himself that he, uh, he is going to die in Berlin. He is not going to try to escape. The Germans have a last ditch, desperate defense of their capital. By this time, they are using, they kind of got two types of soldiers, that the fanatic Nazis and little boys and old men. There are some horrible, horrible pictures of Hitler pinning medals on 12 and 13 and 14 year old boys. Um, people that had grown up with the Hitler youth that were totally into this whole Hitler thing. They're the last soldiers kind of Hitler has left. Um, old men in their 60s and 70s being drafted into the last ditch defense of uh, the German capital. And they make, still to the very, very end, they make the Russians pay for every yard of ground. There's over a million Russian casualties um, in the attack on Berlin. But eventually, on the 29th of April, uh, Hitler marries his longtime mistress, Ava Brown, the next day they commit suicide. Did they have kids? Hitler, no. have kids? Hitler had no children. Um, Goebbels did, his chief of propaganda. He was down in the bunker with Hitler and his wife. The two of them, uh, when their children were sleeping one night, uh, mom and dad poisoned the six kids, aged about four to 16. Um, and then two of them committed suicide the next day. Um, um, Hitler, David Brown took cyanide, um, and Hitler shot himself. What cyanide? Uh, Shot himself. No, Ava Brown took, took poison. They committed suicide together. Ah, wow. Uh, yeah. A week later, a week later, Germany surrendered. Now, here's one more kind of interesting thing, an important thing that I kind of forgot to mention. So he did all that work just the Allies demanded of the Axis powers what's known as unconditional surrender, meaning the surrender would have no conditions. What, the, what they were trying to do was make sure that what happened after World War I did not happen again. Remember, after World War I, the German army is never destroyed, that no Allied troops are on German soil in World War I, so Hitler concocts this story that the army wasn't defeated, it was a bunch of, you know, wussy democratic politicians that let us lose World War I. The Allies this time around say, Germany has been a problem for too long, it's going to unconditionally surrender. What that means is there's no conditions. Once Germany loses, they are completely at the mercy of the Allies. There is no German government, there is no German state, it is administered by the victorious Allies. Uh, that is unconditional surrender, no negotiations. When you surrender, you are completely giving yourselves up to us. Wow. Critics said it made it harder for the Germans to get rid of Hitler. Critics said that it was one thing that made the Germans fight even harder. But the, the idea here is do not, Germany needs to be changed because they've done this now one too many times. Uh, and the surrender was going to be unconditional. Me, what? 
The United States manages to fight an enormous two-front war successfully. Huge population, huge industrial base, he managed to pull this off. Japan, Japan has been at war longer than Germany. In 1933, so Japan, Korea is a Japanese colony from 1910. In 1933, Japan attacks the Chinese province of Manchuria, conquers that. In 1937, Japan attacks China. The problem with attacking China is very similar to the problem attacking Russia. It's very big, and there's a lot of Chinese people. There's a lot of Chinese people. I remember I was pushing Charlotte on the swing, and I was pushing her high, and she says, I can see China. And I said, Charlotte, what do you see in China? And she like waits for like, and she goes, Chinese food. <laughs> Wait, how are there a lot of people in the They're only restricted to one child. They weren't then. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> China is a mess at the time. China, China is fighting a civil war between the communists on one hand and the nationalists on the other. And then into the middle of this civil war comes the Japanese invasion. The two Chinese sides are supposed to kind of put their differences aside and fight the Japanese, but that doesn't really work. Put your phone away, Scott, for the second time. But, as I said, China's big, there's a lot of Chinese people. It turns into this meat grinder. And the Japanese, they don't play by the rules in China either. The Rape of Nanking, uh, if you've ever read about this, it is a terrible, um, on December, see, the attack on Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor is only one part in this gigantic Japanese offensive in the winter 1941-1942. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor over here in Hawaii to neutralize the American fleet, and then the Japanese uh, conquer Hong Kong, French Indochina, Burma, Thailand, Malaya, Singapore, the Dutch East Indies, uh, invade India, they conquer New Guinea, they conquer the Alaskan island of Kiska, they conquer Wake, Kwajalein, Tarawa, threaten Australia. Within six months, by June of 1942, they conquer the Philippines. After they fought the hard for the uh, Douglas MacArthur, the American commander of the Philippines with his Filipino allies, has this desperate defense at a place called Bataan. Um, after the Americans and Filipinos surrender, uh, what happens is known as the Bataan Death March. Uh, the Japanese take their captives and march them without food and water or medical supplies about 200 miles from the jungle where a lot of them die. MacArthur escapes. General MacArthur escapes, promises to his Filipino allies that he will return. Um, but by June of 1942, the Japanese have thrown up this very, very large and powerful empire uh, throughout the Pacific Ocean. The third turning point we're going to talk about is here at a place called Midway. It's called Midway because it's Midway across the Pacific Ocean. Makes sense. At the Battle of Midway, a Japanese fleet is coming to Midway to conquer it as a stepping board towards an invasion of Hawaii. At the Battle of Midway, a little bit of skill and a little bit of luck, as many of these things often involve. Um, to make a long story short, it's a good story, it made some pretty good movies about it. Bull Halsey should have been in command that day, but he got a skin infection, so he stayed home. Um, four American fleet carriers, four Japanese fleet carriers get sunk in a matter of ten minutes um, at Midway, and kind of the offensive ability of Japan is broken. What the rest of the war in the Pacific looks like is island hopping 
which is exactly what it sounds like, hopping from island to island, on our way back towards the home islands of Japan. There's a northern route. That's the one that the Navy wanted. Admiral Nimitz said this is the quickest, shortest way. There's the southern route. This is the one that MacArthur wanted because it involved liberating the Philippines. And the Americans had so many men, so much stuff, that the government said, all right, do both. Uh, so that's exactly what happened. We did both. Britain is fighting over here in India and Burma, trying to make their way back towards their colony of Singapore. Yes. Um, this is very often kind of called the forgotten theater. Uh, a lot of British Empire troops from Australia, New Zealand, um, India, Egypt died um, in the jungles of you know Burma and Thailand and Malaya. But um, eventually, by the end of the war, the British did manage to get back down uh, to their colony at Singapore. The Japanese don't surrender. Individual Japanese soldiers do not surrender. It's considered the height of dishonor. They kill them. They either launch suicide charges against American troops, or officers especially perform a ceremony called harakiri, where you take a knife in, up, and over. Um, and if you don't do that, you bring shame to your entire family and your ancestors, and it's bad. So why did it happen? What? Because that's the ceremony. It's ceremonial. It's ceremonial suicide. Who can do it? Well, the tens of thousands of Japanese officers who did. Yeah. Wait, before they like, even like, 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 if they were like hot in battle, they would have to like be Yeah. So, shh, I got five minutes. I got about five minutes to go. By 1944, Japan is no longer fighting kind of a first world war. Um, they're losing 10, 15 soldiers for every American killed, but they're not stopping. They don't have enough ships and planes to challenge the American dominance at sea. So what they do is they launch what are known as kamikaze attacks. You take an old plane, you load it with bombs, you load it with fuel, you take a volunteer pilot, and there are plenty of volunteer pilots, they do a little religious ceremony, they get in the plane, they fly, and they turn that plane into a flying bomb. They aim that plane at an Allied ship and just crash into it. Sank dozens of Allied ships, killed thousands of American sailors, these kamikaze attacks were constant. The Americans are bombing Japan. Japanese construction is made out of wood. Japanese cities get destroyed in these horrible, horrible firestorms. The bombing of Tokyo kills over 100,000 people in one night. But still the Japanese won't surrender. Enter the atomic. Roosevelt has died. Roosevelt died about three weeks before Hitler. Um, Truman, who has only been vice president since January, it's now April. Um, last president not to have a college degree. Really cool guy. Um, Truman. Truman's president. Um, and they, he has no idea the atomic bomb exists until he's sitting there in Roosevelt's chair. They say, oh, by the way, we have this thing. And Truman. Makes, he sends a message to the Japanese, says if you do not surrender, destruction will rain down on you like never before. The Japanese refuse to surrender. So Truman orders the dropping of one atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima. Japan still does not surrender. That's all the Yes, both of them. The next day, or excuse me, a couple days, uh, three days later, Truman orders the dropping of a second bomb on Hiroshima, Nagasaki. <laughs> The Japanese government, and, oh, and by the way, that same day, the Russians invaded Manchuria, got down halfway to down the Korean Peninsula. That's why the northern half of Korea is communist. Um, in the last days of World War II, the Soviet Union invaded Japanese-held Manchuria. The Japanese still don't know whether they are going to surrender or not. The cabinet is deadlocked seven in favor, seven against. They ask the emperor, make the decision. Uh, the emperor of Japan offers up one condition to the allies. It says, if I can keep my throne, Japan will surrender. And that one condition the allies accepted. 
They attempted to assassinate the emperor. They failed. Oh, they were Japanese. And right? on September 2nd, 1945, six years and one day since Hitler invaded Poland, Japan surrendered and the fight stopped. World War II and 